so if you just do a very simple Google search, what is a black and tan beer? It's one of the first things you get is warning, do not order a black and tan in Ireland, which seems weird. Yeah. You order a half and half, black and tan is offensive. Inspired by the adventures of our nurses, therapists, and techs, A Beer with Atlas is the only healthcare traveling, craft beer drinking podcast. Each week, we'll open a few beers, talk about the brewery and the style of beer, and then dive into some research curated specifically for each episode. In the end, we hope each one sounds like a conversation you'd have with your friends while enjoying a few cold ones. Well, top of the morning to you, and welcome to another episode of A Beer with Atlas. See, I had to start like that. I'm oh Rich. I'm Irish. <laughs> uh, I'm lucky, maybe. Are any of us actually Irish? I'm not. No. Uh, Dolan's got to be. A little bit in me, but. Mm. He's got them all, I think. He's like Pokemon cards. Collect mm. them all. Catch them all. I, uh. I'm a, I'm a little, I'm a, I'm a lot German and a little Czech and a little Polish. So I'm, I'm adjacent maybe. Yeah. You're in the continent. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So it is St. Patrick's day or as close to St. Patrick's day as we could possibly get. Uh, judging from our attire, we all wore some nice green today to celebrate. And with that, we are going to, we're going to delve into the history of the black and tan or as the Irish call it, the half and half. So I figured we would give this one a shot because we've never done that before. No, you know what I, I like to call a half and half is my blood. Half alcohol, half blood. <laughs> That's my half and half. All right. So uh, I must be Irish. Yeah, so why not? So, all right, we're going to go two different directions here because the traditional half and half, black and tan, layered bar drink, whatever you want to call it, has, is is a – Stout like Guinness. Obviously, we've got a stout here like Guinness. We've got Murphy's, which we've done before. Both of them are acceptable, I believe, for a black and tan. Uh, and then you can use, I'm, I'm going to go a traditional Irish route. So I'm going to use Smittix Red Ale as the bottom and then Guinness on top. Brian, I think you're going to do something different. I don't like being traditional. So I'm going craft beer ish. Um, this is from Wisconsin, Sheboygan, to be precise. Um, Three Sheeps Brewing Company. And the beer is called Fresh Coast. And it's a juicy pale ale. Oh, so, interesting. Um, we're going to pour those. Right. Got a pint glass. Is that what you're working with there? Or a big stein? Or what do you got? I've got, well, I've got my, my regular little Pizza Hut glass here. I'm going to oh, okay. I'm, I'm gonna mix it here. I'm going to adjust my camera so we can watch the fun here as we, as we do this. So you can uh, use Murphy's over Guinness. You can, yeah. Okay. Well, I might do that if you're doing the Guinness. I'll, I'll probably go Murphy's and Smittics. The idea here is the lighter beer on the bottom. Right? Yours looks very uh, red. It's a, well, Smittics is a red, yeah. Okay. It's yeah, and then I'm a, I love opening here. Let's get it close to the mic. I love opening the Guinness can. Ready? Here we go. Sounds Sound like there's a little bird in there. <laughs> there's a little, the little, yeah, little bird. Now, are you supposed to? You're supposed to have like a spoon or something, right? Well, I've seen that happen at, at bars. Um, yeah. This is what I've got. Check this out. The perfect black and tan. Oh, where did you get that from? I got it. Uh, somebody gave it to me once upon a time, and I kept it ever since. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it almost looks like the thing you put in a drain in a kitchen sink, like a stopper. That's what it looks like, yeah. It looks like that. Uh, I have never used this, but I figured today's the day. So I'm not using the spoon. I'm just going straight on top, and you can see... It's it looks great. like it's working. Awesome. It's working. Yeah, you gotta let the foam die down there. Yep. So I let the foam die down. I did some research on this as to 
why why it works the way that it does. Okay. Like, what's the what's the story here? Why what goes on the bottom? What goes on the top? You would think the Guinness, which you would think of the heavier, darker beer, would go on the bottom. Yes. When in fact it is not. Mm. The, the heavier beer is the pale, or in this case, the red ale that goes on the bottom. The Guinness is actually the, a lighter beer, just from the gravity standpoint, from the okay. from gravity's sake. Uh, the layering of Guinness on top is possible because of the lower relative density of the Guinness, which doesn't seem like that makes sense, but it does. Uh, the opposite scenario where the layer on top is heavier than the bottom would produce a buoyancy instability. And I actually wrote in quotation marks, buoyancy instability resulting in the two beers mixing together. Hmm. I got to tell you, it almost kind of looks like they're mixing here a little bit. And maybe I need, I need the rubber stopper like you've got in order to make it not do that. Well, here's, Dolan, what do you got? Have you, you saw foam issues? Uh, it's, I mean, yeah. Another thing I think is you got to go slow. I think is from what I've, I've done it with a spoon before and you had to go slow. Dolan's looks pretty good. It's really, and you could see the, black and tan <laughs> yeah right i don't know if you can get it on the camera here but in the light i can see it i can definitely see and maybe because brian pointed out it does look very my red ale is darker than maybe a pale would look and so mm -hmm. the differentiation between the two is 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 tough to see so here's my pale right okay and then this thing this metal thing just fits right in the top of the pint glass Okay. And it's got a little lip on it, like what would be the spoon part, right? Right. So I'm going to open my Guinness. Which, Try not to spill on my work computer. Yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> PTSD for Rich there. Stop pumpkin beers this time, that's for sure. I always love how Guinness and Mark works. Can, can you guys see that at all? Oh, yeah. Uh, see how it kind of trickles through the holes there? Oh, it does, yeah. And it's kind of trickling down the sides. But you can see a definite delineation between the two of yours right there. So I'm just going to do it slow. You can keep talking while I'm pouring. I was drinking the, air, the rest of my Smittix here. So uh, I always like, they sound like, both of these sound like spray paint cans with the little <laughs> ball floating around in there. They both sound like spray paint cans. It surprises me every time I open one. It's like, I'm not expecting it. So it's just like, whoa, it's going to go everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but I, okay. I think I found, and this is for, okay, we always go back to like the beer novice, right? If the beer novice, first time beer drinker is listening to us or, or whatever, if, and you're at a St. Patrick's Day style of thing, the Smittix here, Smith Wicks, Smittix is a very approachable red ale. It's very sweet, 4.5% ABV. Oh, look at that. It's gorgeous. Look at that color on that, Brian. The tool. That, it's always, a, it's all about the tools. Man, I need one of those. I probably should have put some more pale ale in the bottom, but that is a black and tan-ish because mine's more not tan color on the bottom, but that's what it's supposed to look like. So I, can, I could see in person with the Smedics, the it's like red yeah. here and then black here but you, that's kind of what i've got red from here down uh -huh. yep. yep you got the same thing i do but you can't see it and if you're watching on the youtube version or the video version you can't see it through the camera but it's definitely there <laughs> yeah it, it's not as dramatic as maybe some of the pictures you see or maybe if you order one at a bar brian's looks more traditional than ours does for sure I think a lot of that is that nitro, you know, it just kind of fluffs it up, but there's again, what it looks like. Yeah. So I did a little research as to where, why they started doing these in the first place in Ireland, London, in the UK, right? So why they started doing these and, okay. and kind of the reasoning behind them. Here's what I found. There's always, it, it's always, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Is that how it goes? Yes. Yes. 
So in this case, the necessity was, I don't want to pay a lot of taxes. Yeah, so, that's still going on today. Right? London, 1700s, they were making beer blends and they called them three threads or five threads. So thread would have been your, your differentiation, right? Okay. So one beer, they're putting heaviest beer on the bottom, lighter beer, lighter beer, lighter beer, not light beer like Miller Lite, right? But light or gravity style beer up on top of them. And they were doing this because three threads and then five threads after that, every beer had a tax to go along with it. So the less beer that you poured, the less tax you had to pay. So the heavier beers had more tax, lighter beers had less tax. So they're mixing them together. They're putting them into the same glass to minimize the tax burden back to whoever is drinking, whoever is consuming it. So the bartender, pub, whatever, is thinking about their, their customer saying, okay, I'm going to... I don't want to charge you as much for this. So I'm going to put, here's a three thread and you're going to pay less tax on this because of that. So that, that leaves me with a couple of questions. First of all, how much do you think a beer costs then? Because I would be, I would do that now when you're talking $9 pints, sure. but like how much is the tax to do tax evasion for a few pennies? I, I don't know, man, mm. like just pay it. But that's just me. That's I just me. Here's, uh, here's the thing. Like, it, the taxing got so bad when it got over here that we threw a bunch of tea into Boston Harbor. So, I mean, and how much are you taxing on a little glass of tea? Is it the same as beer? I mean, is that, I mean, we had, we colonists here in the States had the same reaction ish to, Hey, that's too much of a tax on my little glass of tea or on my box of tea or whatever that they're having here in the 1700s about, about this. Sure. So, I guess that makes sense. Hmm. I don't, no. this thing's so pretty. I don't even want to drink it. It is pretty. The, the Guinness on top, it reminds me, it reminds me again why I don't order Guinness. But at the same time, it reminds me like, okay, this is, it, it's Guinness. That's what it is. It's like once a year I can drink it, you know, and yeah. that's okay. So it's also reported and debated, which is kind of fun, that the three threads is the reason that that stouts and porters were developed in the first place. So you could do something like this. So stouts came first and I believe porters came next. So they developed them. So you could continue to add these layers to minimize that tax burden. That sounds good. Yeah. There's, if you really dig into everything, you know, there's always a story about stuff like this. And I, I think there was maybe one night a few years ago, we decided to make these and I don't know that I've ever had one since. So Kind of fun to revisit those things. I can't honestly say I've ever gone into a bar and said, I'll take a black and tan. Maybe if you're in Ireland or someplace, Europe, England, maybe you could do that. I don't know, but it'd be weird if you went to like cross train and did that. Yeah, no, that'd be weird. Give me the, give me the cross train black and tan. How do you, I mean, you could, I guess. I mean, there's, you could take their base stout and get their base pale and they could do it. Yeah. But sure. And I, th I think uh, there's other people making beer blends craft breweries are doing those. There's, um, you know, things you put together. Uh, I've done one with mead and, uh, a beer out of uh, Kankater that worked pretty well. So there's, you know, all sorts of different mixes you can do. Uh, I want to hit up my craft beer brewery beer that I poured in here to start with. Yeah. I have a little information on them. Again, Three Sheeps Brewing out of Sheboygan. Uh, you've been talking a lot of science early on in this podcast, and, and I think this ties in well with them. It says, we are equal parts heart and science. We let our hearts inform our creativity and ask big questions like, can we brew a beer with ghost peppers? Or how do we make an IPA that hasn't been done before? Then we use meticulous research and scientific process to figure out how to make our ideas work. We like to make beers that no one else is brewing in ways that no one else is brewing them, but in a way that's so balanced, you wouldn't have noticed if we didn't tell you. So, I mean, they put it on their label. They put it right on their website, three or four different places. They really are like science based, which just seems a weird thing to like proclaim on your beer website, but that's maybe the, the world we live in now is maybe an extra selling point. 
Um, as far as goes into beer, though, right? I mean, yeah. there's a ton of science that goes in. Oh, beer. for sure. Um, this place looks like it would be a fun hang. Um, it's got like the German style um, long tables, you know, long picnic tables. Um, it looked like there was three or four sets of those in the tap room. They have 17 beers on tap that are theirs. Um, they always have these beers. So I'll read through their list of, you know, standard year round beers, uh, pendulum IPA, water slides IPA. This one I'm drinking fresh coast, juicy pale ale. They have a three sheeps Pilsner. They have rebel Kent Amber ale, cashmere hammer, nitro stout. So if we could, if I had a, had one of those, we could have used that today instead of a Guinness, but those are their year round beers. Then they have uh, four seasonals that I could find on the website. One's called Tiki Time. It's passion fruit golden ale. Yes, I'll take then that. Then they've got a Bon Bon chocolate milk stout, which I have one of those in my fridge for later this weekend. Uh, they have an Oktoberfest that's just called Oktoberfest. And then they have one called Pool Party, which they call a lemon ale. So lemon, lemonade and an ale put together like a shandy. Um, but that's their like big summer seasonal. Uh, the hours for this place, uh, Monday through Wednesday, two to nine, Thursday, 11 to nine, Friday, Saturday, 11 to 10, and Sunday, 11 to six. The last thing I wanna kind of uh, say about these guys, they have a barrel age program, which a lot of breweries are doing. And the three that they showcased on their website, one was called Uber Joe, which is barrel aged coffee stout. Uh, one, I like the name for this one, it's called PTO. Mm -hmm. Presumably after you drink it, you'll need PTO. Uh, <laughs> it's an imperial stout that has walnuts, which I've, I don't think I've ever seen that in a, in a stout or maybe any beer, walnuts oh. being added. And then they have one called Veneration, which is their barrel-aged quad, and it's got figs and molasses. So kind of that wintry vibe, um, mm -hmm. pre-Christmas, some of that spiced uh, flavor, um, Belgian style, you know, strong. All these beers were over 12%. Uh, I think one of them was like 13.6. That might've been the, oh, the Wolf. That's their last one. That's just an Imperial Stout, barrel aged Imperial Stout. Nothing added, no flavors, no adjuncts, which kind of hard to find those nowadays. And there it was. I, didn't, I muted, so you yeah. didn't see it. Yeah, but I, I could still see it, so that was fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you're in the Sheboygan, Wisconsin area, pop over. Look like they had food. Um, looks like they have pretty cool merchandise. They have a society, like a lot of places are doing, where you buy, you know, pay a membership fee for a year and you get percents off, um, things like that. Um, I think they had food that you could order there or like that you could deliver it to the place it looked like uh, a lot of merchandise just a this is a neat spot to hang it looks like be a good spot to watch a football game or something but so that's my uh brewery research for this place sheboygan sticks in my head because uh there's sheboygan sausage they advertise during cubs baseball and they have a terrible yeah. terrible theme song where they just oh, sing what about is it sheboygan. i'm not gonna sing it Oh, uh, it's, it's pretty bad, but I've always wanted to try their sausage. Now, like I got to listen to this commercial, however many times during a Cubs game, I'm going to eat this, whatever kind of sausage they got, probably drink beer. This place sounds awesome. That does sound good. Um, one other thing I thought was kind of cool. You can write online book like tours, or if you want to like reserve the whole place for, you've got an event, especially currently, um, they're down for that. So if you've got a, a group of people that want to get together and in a safe way, they've got a bunch of, they noted uh, they had like three or four air filters in their brewery that they put in uh, during this COVID times. Um, their prices were pretty reasonable too. So a crowler, we're talking 32 ounces of most of their standard beers was like less, was eight bucks or less. Um, some of them were $9 and that includes like their IPAs and their hazies, stuff like that. Um, some of the other beers that they do, they have like slushy beers. We've seen those before. So overly fruited beers. Yep. Um, those are 12 bucks for a crowler, which is still pretty reasonable. Yeah. And then they do actual growlers, which a lot of places don't do anymore. 
So yeah. you're talking 64 ounces of beer. Uh, some of those are anywhere from 14 bucks. I think the highest I saw was 17. So um, pretty on the money for pricing. Like that's cheap for around here. Yeah. That's, that's just who good doesn't need fun. another growler, right? Right. I was going to say the last growler I bought was like 60 bucks. <laughs> but you could buy three of these. Yeah. Okay, Dolan, you did you did mine. Brian, I'll be interested when you've seen this how like I, I really have never had this before. Mm -hmm. When you get to the bottom beer, yeah, I, there was a definite delineation in taste, in flavor. Mm. So one one drink here, Guinness, put it down. Next drink up, now it's Smittix. Like it was just like that. So I must have caught it right at the huh. and there was no mix because it was like it was almost like I grabbed a different and, weird. and yeah it was kind of weird see for me the aroma of that pale ale that's what i'm getting that's what my nose is saying is going to happen in my brain but then when i drink it it's just straight guinness so yeah i'm guessing that might happen too interesting now i wonder if we're we'll going we'll, we'll do a snake bite here in a little bit and the snake bite i don't have nearly i don't have any research on that quite honestly is a cider so like an a, a, a traditional english english cider so we're going to use strongbow and then a stout that's a snake bite. So I'm guessing an English cider is dry would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Less, less sweet. Less sweet. Um, yep. We've talked about Guinness before. You know, we've, this is what our third or at least second St. Patrick's day. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to get a little Guinness research for you, oh. uh, but not the kind you're thinking. Okay. We're going to talk about Sir Alec Guinness. Oh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. That's right. Near and dear to your heart. Absolutely. Uh, not Irish, but English. So good enough for today. Um, he, I have, I've written down a list of movies that he was in prior to Star Wars, because that's what I knew him from, right? So that's he, in 1977. He called Star Wars rubbish. He didn't want to do it. He told George, George Lucas to piss off. He's like, I'm uh, not doing a space movie. The quote was fairy tale rubbish. There you go. Yes. Um, but he was nominated for an Oscar, for an Oscar for that movie for Best Supporting Actor. As well he should. So the first thing I found him in, um, let's see, it was like in 1930. So he was 20 years old. He was working as an advertising copywriter. And he was doing like theater in London area. And at 20, he gets his first job in the theater. And he's like, peace, I'm out of here. And he was acting pretty much ever since. Um, there was a movie I've never seen, but I, I wrote down cause it was noteworthy. Um, 1949, he was in a movie called kind hearts and coronets. And the thing that's interesting about that one is he played nine different characters in that movie. Oh. So we thought Eddie Murphy was in Arsenio were pretty great and coming to America with three. Well, he's got nine. So take that. Um, he's in a movie, uh, adaptation, like in the fifties, maybe early sixties of great expectations. Uh, he was in Oliver Twist. He's in the original Lady Killers movie. Um, he won an Oscar for The Bridge Over the River Kwai, which I have seen. Uh, he was in Lawrence of Arabia. He was in Dr. Zhivago. These are all-time classic movies. Um, Dolan, even you have maybe heard of one of those, I would hope. Um, he was Jacob Marley's ghost in 1970's Scrooge. So that might be another place you've, you've seen him pop up. Um, one of the other things that was interesting, I never knew this about him. He didn't know who his dad was. So this was, he was born, it would have been right after World War I. And he lived with his mom. And this guy used to come around every once in a while and she would call him his uncle. And he was a Scottish banker. And this guy just happened to pay for young Alex schooling. So he, he footed the bill. Uh, he was, you know, let's call him, I don't know, Uncle Ted. And he would come and visit every once in a while. Um, but the, he never really knew who it was. was he Because uh, back then. Do uh, you think he was still diddling his mom when he came to visit? He, well, you never know. You didn't do those things back then. Um, in England at that time, you did not have to put the father's name on the birth certificate. Oh. So that's why he never was able to really confirm it. Um, he won 
We talked about the Oscar thing. He also won a Tony. So that's being on Broadway. That's like, you know, the best performers on Broadway. Uh, he was the title character, Dylan Thomas, in a show called Dylan. And Dylan Thomas is a famous Welsh poet hmm. who um, there's a song about by Better Oblivion Community Center, Dolan, that is Connor Oberst and Phoebe Bridgers band. The first single off of that album was called Dylan Thomas. So if you want to, you know, get hip with the kids, you can listen to that track. And uh, it's all about the late great poet, Dylan Thomas. I had no idea that those two did a song together. That's cool. They have an album together, dude. They had a whole band and they toured. Huh. And you missed it at the waiting room. I, hmm. I missed it completely. <laughs> Apparently. Remember how remember how Dolan looked when you were talking about movies that Alec Guinness was in? That's yeah. how I look right now when you talk about these two <laughs> Yep. That's just how it works. Yeah, that's how it works. Hmm. So I have a fun Alec Guinness story. You want to hear my okay. Alec Guinness story? Yes, of course. I'm reading the I, I believe it's the autobiography, because I think he or he ghost he had a ghostwriter, one of the two. He uh, wrote he wrote three autobiographies. Oh, Alec Guinness did. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm talking, the guy that played C-3PO. Oh, wrote, Daniels. Yeah, Anthony Daniels wrote a, I, I, I want to say autobiography. I don't know if that's right. I don't know. He wrote a ghostwriter, whatever. Uh, one of the first stories he tells is how he gets the job as C-3PO. And then the first, the first like scenes that they shoot are in the desert in Tunisia, which is Tatooine. And they all have to get on this airplane. And by that time, Alec Guinness is like the dude's royalty already, right? I mean, he's, he's a legend all, already. Yeah. And he's, and Anthony Daniels is a younger actor, a stage actor. And he's just in awe of, of, and he finally gets up the courage to talk to him. And so they're traveling on this plane to go to Tunisia. He finally gets up the courage to talk to him and his wife. And he's like, he's very, he was very, um, gracious and and uh he said you know if you ever have any questions or whatever i'd be happy to help you anyway so they get there and anthony daniels and mark hamill luke skywalker get in this little yugo to drive two and a half hours out in the desert and a limo pulls up for sir alec guinness and before he gets in the limo he's like anthony come here and he's like did you get your did you get your per diem yet your food money and Anthony's like, yeah, I don't, I, maybe, I don't know. He's like, I don't, I don't even know what to say to him. And Alleginus reaches into his pocket, just grabs a wad full of cash and goes, here you go, kid, they gave me too much. And he gives him all the money that he had in his pocket. Then he gets in his limousine and they drive off into the desert. And that's, that, that's perfect. That's, met. that's like, that's the beginning of their relationship. And it's just, it, there's, there's just, just some poetic beauty to all of it. That sounds like something that would happen in like 1976. Exactly. Take a, take a limo to the desert in Tunisia, <laughs> throwing out wads of cash. Here you go. Here you go, kid. They gave me too much. And he's probably drinking champagne in that limousine. That'd be my guess. Well, he brought his wife. Yeah. He's like, I mean, that's part of the deal. Like, okay, I'll, I'll play this hokey wizard character. Space cowboy, you. but yeah. But I got to bring my wife on set. Family's on vacation, so yeah. Whatever you want, Mr. Guinness. <laughs> yeah there you go that's that's my alec guinness research so this is fun because so alec guinness was a uh, was an englishman right now irish stout that's where i mean that's the guinness right here yeah and typically you're making this with like you said like with with a pale ale in england ireland wherever they would use bass which is a pale ale. okay they use that to represent the Irish and English refusing to blend. Yeah, so that makes sense. That it's kind of a fun, yeah. There, there's some, there's this, but it, a little friction there, there. there. Yeah, there's there's something fun about that. So now, clearly, Dolan and I made ours all Irish. So to hell with the Brits. Yeah, we're going all Irish today. And we beat the Brits, so that's why I used American beer. There you go. Yeah. We should at some point though try a traditional with the with the bass. Bass, yeah. Bass is one of those beers you see around. You like glance over it at the store. Usually I'm just like, oh yeah, there it is. There's that red triangle thing. Yeah. Well, that, is, 
is Murphy is Irish? Is it or is it English? Mm, let's see. Murphy. It's Irish. It's in Cork, I believe. That's where they make that beer. I believe you're right. Yeah. I can't yep. find it on here anyway. Cork, Cork Ireland. Because guess what? I have some research on Murphy's coming up. Good segue, right. Dolan. Hey, hey. So one of the things I found before you before you go to that, one of the things I thought was was interesting. I realize I say that a lot. I find this interesting. I find a lot of the stuff we talk about on here interesting. Yeah. Uh, there's like different stories to where the name came from. Where For Black Guinness? Can. No, the Oh, Black okay. Can. All right. And so if you just do a very simple Google search, what is a Black and Tan beer? It's one of the first things you get is warning, do not order a Black and Tan in Ireland, which seems weird. Yeah. You order a half and half, Black and Tan is offensive because... Mm. Oh the black and tans were another name for the violent Royal Irish constabulary constabulary constabulary. That's like police force. There we go. There we go. Constabulary reserve force sent by Britain into Ireland in the 1920s. And that name is they, like, apparently they did bad things. So yes. not good. They so call them black and tans. Half and half. So you call it a half and half. Now, there's some other there, there's some arguments here. So uh, the well, some might think it refers to Irish politics. So this was another. This wasn't even Wikipedia. I've got the Wikipedia one on here, which is even more interesting. Uh, we now this is like a BuzzFeed article. Okay, so for what it's worth, we can assure you that it does not. The name is derived from the two beers that it requires: a pale ale and a Guinness. So that's where the, in a very basic sense, that's where the name comes from. Now, the Wikipedia version tells you the term likely originated in England where consumers have blended different beers since at least the 17th century. The name black and tan had earlier been used to describe the coats of dogs, such as the black and tan coon hound. The earliest recorded usage of the term in the drink is from 1881, according to Oxford's English Dictionary, in an American magazine called Puck. So mm. we are using it's our our magazine in 1881 yeah. called a black and tan. The first recorded British use of the term is in 1889. So they hear us calling it that, and they think eh, that's a cool name. Huh? We'll but do they've that. been making making these kind of drinks for a long time. So the argument would be. You call it a half and half. Yeah. But so, we named it the black and tan. We Americanized it. Yeah. Like, like the French gave us the croissant and we made it the croissant sandwich. That's right. Just big big ups to Burger King. Those there are good. Go. <laughs> there you go. How many people, do you think this is like a popular thing? Did it used to be popular? Were people ordering these all the time? I, I How has it know. survived? That's a good question. I think it's just one of those things like it's just been around forever. So it just kind of hangs around. And if you're an Irish bar, then you're just kind of expected to have it. Like you're expected to have Irish whiskey, maybe. Sure. It's kind of like a boiler maker. You know, like most people know what they are. Maybe you've had one in your lifetime, but it's still out there. I don't yeah. know. Apparently the term Irish car bomb is offensive to the Irish too. They have different names for that as well, but we clearly aren't, uh, we aren't drinking Irish. We don't care about feelings in America too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm I think gonna... I'm going to rinse, right? So let's uh, rinse out and refill. All right. So then we can uh, do the next snake bite thing. Okay, so let's do the uh, let's do the snake bite now. I'm gonna I'm gonna pour. So I poured the the strongbow, the 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 uh, English cider into the glass. Now, oh, let's. This has got the nitro here too. Let's listen to this. Ooh, it's angry. It's a little angry. So now, let's with the spoon. Oh shit. Look at me <laughs> oh, 
It wouldn't be an episode without you spilling on the table. I know, right? Well, I'm starting. Oh, yeah, I'm starting to see. Come on. I even like watched like tutorials on this, and I'm still really, really bad at it. But yeah, you're right. It wouldn't be an episode if I wasn't spilling beer on whatever else. We need to do like a little compilation of you just spilling beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's just riveting to listen to like as you're driving or whatever, but you start to see, look, uh, you can really, really get the color difference on this one, which we didn't necessarily have before. I'm going to go Dolan. full on with this. As Dolan is pouring his as well. Now you're using Murphy's. I'm going to use Guinness. Okay. Ooh. Ooh, yours had a little birdie in it too. We're gonna see. I'm getting more cascading on this Murphy's than I got on the Guinness. I noticed that as well. Which is usually what you think of. Now I don't know if you can see this rich on mine, but I've got like four different levels of color. It's in, yeah. You've got a lighter level, then you have the yeah, you have the lightest, then you have like a lighter all going all the way up. I don't, I don't know, Dolan, look at this. Like I, this is, this looks pretty good. Like this pour kind of looks like you would, you would think. And yeah, that looks pretty here, good. For everything that I spilled on the table here, I'm actually kind of proud of that one. I was saying uh, when I use the Murphy's for the black and tan or the half and half, mm -hmm. um, and I could, I could see the difference. It wasn't showing up very well on the camera, but it showed up pretty nicely in person. Let's see. Yeah, I, I'm really surprised by just how well that mixed. Or Oh, yeah, Dolan, that looks pretty good. Right? Yeah, this, this looks pretty good, right? Yeah, you, you definitely. So did you go with Murphy's or Guinness on that one, Brian? So I went with, oh, Brian, I went with Guinness. Okay. And I went, I went Murphy's. Interesting. It's definitely got that nitro head on the top for sure. Oh, without a doubt. You can see, yeah. I mean, you can see that on mine as well. Like that looks like, like there's a nice little flat thing of ice cream right there on top. Yep. It's kind of fun watching right where it is. Cause it, it like, it's jiggling a bit and you can see. It's like, yeah, it's going in and out. It's almost like a inverse lava lamp. Yeah. Yeah. Like a lava lamp. Here's, okay, so you know how on the other one, on the pale ale, Brian, you said you could all you could smell pale. Yeah, that through. I can put your nose right up in there, and you get you get the cider smell coming through. Big time. Yeah, it's like the other thing's not even in there. It, that's so strange. And quite honestly, is this the reason why it's kind of stuck around? Because it is kind of weird, it's like like a novelty, like a bar oh. trick. Sure. Probably. It doesn't taste bad either. I, I like, I don't want to, like I said, I don't ever order a Guinness in or a Murphy's or whatever. Like if I go to a place, but I sure like to watch them pour them. Yeah. Because how that looks in the cascading effect on the sides and you know, how it looks coming back up is, is super interesting to watch. Hmm. Well, let's, let's taste this thing. Okay. Yeah. Clean my spilled beer off. The table here. Dolan's right. We should have like a compilation of all the beers I've spilled. Mm, I think I prefer this one so far. The top layer, at least. That's delicious. I like the Murphy's. Yeah. I do. If, if we're doing like a blind taste test, I, I would pick that one. I don't know if there's a mix happening here where you're getting some of the cider as well. I didn't taste anything. I didn't definitely doesn't taste like it smells. What about you, Dolan? Mm, I like, so again, I use Guinness. I like how you get the Guinness, but you get all of that apple in your, in your Smell? nose. Yeah. Maybe yeah. That's what it, yeah. Maybe that's what it is. You're just, your, your nose is tricking your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely is. Well, the beautiful thing about this is we've only used half of each of these. So you can try another combination the other way you didn't do it before and, and you can see which one you prefer. Mm. 
do this. Take a bigger drink and then set the glass down, not hard, but set it down. And you'll see the Murphy's kind of did this. It kind of like <laughs> kind of gyrated Shifted. back and forth. It didn't mix, but it just kind of gyrated back and forth in the glass. It was weird to watch. Almost like jello a little bit. Mm, sounds yeah. like me on the dance floor. <laughs> can see. I don't know if I can get that. It's hard because the. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. But it's. I definitely like this more. And yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Let me uh, hit you with some Murphy's information just a little bit. Not We're not going deep, but just on the surface here. So like we talked about earlier, it's made in Cork, Ireland. Um, it was local owned and operated from like 1856 till 1983. And then guess who shows up? Heineken. Mm. And they say, hey, we would like to purchase said product and brewery. And they said, okay. So in the 80s and 90s, there was a huge push by Guinness to keep their market share. And these guys, Murphy's, were like, you know what? It's kind of like the Soda Wars, mm. the 80s. They're like, we wanted some of that market share. So they started advertising. And Heineken pushed a lot of money towards stealing some of that Guinness dollar, right? It didn't work. Nobody bought it. Nobody still buys it. So we might have bought the only Murphy's this year, at least in Nebraska. It's not something that's out there. Um. They, they brew it to be less heavy and less bitter than Guinness. And Guinness is what, like 4%, 4.2, 4. something like that? I think that's right. So yeah. this is about 4, you might guess. I don't know. Uh, yeah, 4 on the can, 4% for the Murphys. Yeah. Okay. So you're talking like less than a session IPA. This is less than a Bud Light. Yeah, by a lot. A lot. By less 20%. Than a, yeah, less than a Bush Light. Yep. This is, you're, you're in Michelob Ultra territory. Yeah, and you're getting a quote-unquote stout. Wow. So they have 5% of the Irish stout market. That's Murphy's. That's it, 5%. It's and then the only reason they have 5% is because in Cork, where they're from, so in Cork, Ireland, they have 28% of the market there. And that's what gives them five. Otherwise, they would have less than 5%. You, you got to own your be own backyard, right? I mean, well, and they don't, they don't even do that. They have 28%. <laughs> I guess that's better than none. Um, the River Lee in Cork is where the water is sourced. And that's what they said gives its unique and delicious flavor. Mm. And I'm not mad at this one. I, I think I prefer this to Guinness. I, I know when we did this last year, and we had Murphy's and Guinness right head to head. Mm -hmm. I liked Murphy's more. I like Murphy's more this year. Yeah. But I, I know some hardcore Guinness guys too. So yeah. that would only drink Guinness. They yeah. said, and, and I saw this when I poured it, it they call it a, dis, a distant relative of chocolate milk. So that first pour I did, it looked like a you like a yoo -hoo, Is that what they're called? Yeah. yeah. It, that's what it looked like to me. Like, or one of those... PBR iced coffee drinks. <laughs> like when I was pouring it, that's what I wanted it to be. Uh, and it wasn't, but that's okay. And then in 1997, I wrote this down because I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, they released a commercial and it was an anime commercial from the people that made Ghost in the Shell. What? And so you put that together with Murphy's Irish Stout in anime and you get this like 45 second long mini movie commercial that they put out and it really did nothing for them. Their advertising uh, budget was up high for that. They paid a lot for it and got a little return, but it's on YouTube. If you want to check it out, uh, it's kind of interesting. I did, I did watch it, but um, that's just a little surface information on Murphy's for us. I, I'm just, I'm baffled by the ghost in the shell guys doing a commercial from, for a stout in Ireland. Gotta pay the bill somehow. I guess. So I, I did less on, I, the snake bite's just interesting because it makes a lot of sense. You want something sweeter than a pale. 
okay, that's fine. What I did find though is these half and halves, whatever you want to call them, right? The, uh, the three threads, five threads aren't, they're not new. This is, this is a thing that's been around for as long as there's been beer around and not necessarily for like tax reasons or whatever. They were just doing them in different ways. So I've got some different ones here okay. that I thought would be kind of fun to talk about because there, there's some interesting concoctions here. So okay. beer, beer cocktails, so to speak. So uh, the first one is called a Black Velvet. Very popular song. Yeah, that was. And some cheap whiskey, I think. Mm, Black yep. Velvet. So Black Velvet is a beer cocktail made with a stout. And it says often Guinness, but it doesn't, it doesn't specify. And the bottom part, so this part down here, the lighter part, is champagne. Ooh. So uh, it was first made by a bartender in, of Brooks Club in London in 1861 to mourn the death of Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's prince. It was supposed to symbolize the black or purple cloth armbands worn by the mourners. Uh, and it said even the champagne should be in, in mourning. So talk about a dry drink. If you're drinking dry mm -hmm. stout and dry champagne, ooh. You would be in morning drinking. Yeah, well, the next morning will suck. Mm. It wouldn't be too different from, from this, though. I mean, I, I wouldn't think unless your champagne's really, really dry and not as sweet. So if, if you use a cider or perry, which is a pear cider, I believe, is a perry, mm -hmm. uh, in place of the champagne, it's still known as a black velvet there. So they're not calling it a snake bite. That Amer is a, an American term. Uh, they're, they're still calling it a black velvet. Outside of that, um, you could also call this the poor man's black velvet. So if you went to a traditional Irish bar and you said, give me a poor man's black velvet, they should know what that is. Because it's what. cheaper than champagne. Correct. Cider is okay. cheaper to make than champagne. And to buy. Yep. In Germany, they make one with a Schwarz beer. So we've had a Schwarz beer or two mm -hmm. on here. So a dark lager served in a beer stein. So they, they use either a pail or some sort of sweet or bottom section. Uh, and they call that a Bismarck. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's for Otto von Bismarck. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Didn't really say, but that's the, that's the German version of it. Not to be outdone, the Germans had to, they had to come up with yeah. some kind of take on like, this. Oh, right? you think that's cool? Well, watch what we can do. Mm. We're going to use a Schwarz beer. Beers that taste good. Uh, a champagne velvet appeared for the first time in Jacob Grohus Grohusko's 1910 cocktail guide called Jack's Manual, which I've heard of Jack's Manual before. Yeah. Uh, it calls for equal parts cold porter and champagne. Then it's stirred slowly in a goblet. Ooh, fancy. You stir it slowly. So it's more of a mix, I guess. You're trying to make it mixed together. You're not having layers. Right. So that's why it's called a champagne velvet. Uh, and then finally, the Canadians have a take on it, similar to the black velvet, uh, but with an additional layer. It's called the Bien Joje, B-I-E-N-J-O-J-A-Y. So it's made with cider. Oh, sorry, here we go. Cider, white beer. So a, like a Belgian wit, maybe it's okay. just a white beer and then Guinness. So it's got three layers. Huh. So that's how the Canadians do it. It sounds like French. So maybe it's from Quebec. Quebec. Yes. Yeah. That, that'd be my guess. And that's uh, pretend Paris. And then what they call Quebec pretend Paris. Maybe <laughs> I know that Kansas city is the Paris of the plains. You ever heard that? Is that true? I don't, is that? Yeah, because they have more fountains than any place other than like someplace in Italy. Hmm. Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's, there's, there's tons. That's a good, uh, I, like, I prefer the snake bite. I do too. And I don't, I don't like ciders. I don't like sweet stuff. But um, it just but mellows it, it enough. Because if you yes, try it, it on it their own. It sweet down. <sighs> yeah, so sweet. It's just, and dry. Mm -hmm. And Murphy's is definitely a 
dry stout. Hmm. So what do you think? Would you guys do this sometime in, in the future if uh, you ever can see people again? Would you ever have a night where you just made a couple of these? I am uh, craving a corned beef and mm -hmm. cabbage right now. So yeah. yes, the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, yes, I think there's, a, uh, uh, there's an Irish bar not too far from my house, 144th and center. So not, not super far. I would like to go and order one and, and see what I get. Yeah, see what, if they know what's up. Right. All right, here's my last little bit of information for us, a little research. This is very much St. Patrick's Day related, and it is related to the snake bite. So we're going to talk about snakes in Ireland. <music> That's what everybody thinks. St. Patrick did. In the 5th century, he shows up to Ireland. He's trying to convert the people that live there from paganism to, I think, Catholicism. And he gets rid of the snakes. Drives them all out. They all get in the ocean and swim away. Uh, there's one problem with that. There never were snakes in Ireland to begin with. <laughs> It was uh, part of a bigger landmass a long time ago. Um, and then the Ice Age happened, right? And then after the Ice Age, some of the glaciers melted, like what we're doing right now. And the land bridge was cut off. So before that could happen, some animals did make it across. So in Ireland, you could find wild boars, lynx, which is kind of like a bobcat sort of creature. Um, type of guy, yeah. And they even have brown bears. Cool. Uh, there's one reptile in the whole country of Ireland, and it's just the common lizard. So it was super cold. They didn't survive. One made it across, and that's what you'll find there. So they never had snakes. Um, here's the snake bite part. March 5th, 2020. The very first recorded Venomous snake bite happens in Ireland, in the whole country. What, what, what's the date? What's the date? March 5th, 2020. Last year? Yes. It was the first time a venomous snake bit somebody. What? It was a puff adler, which are very poisonous. And it was this 22-year-old guy, and he had this as a pet. So you can have snakes as pets in Ireland, um, but they don't, they're not there all the time, right? So he gets bit. And he's going to die because these things, they don't mess around. These, these are real, real deadly snakes. Who has um, heard they don't keep a lot of antidote? <laughs> good point, Dolan. Guess yeah. what? He's, he's in the hospital, and they're like, we don't have anti-venom here. Uh, the only place in the entire country that has it that we know of is at the National Reptile Zoo. Mm. I think it was in Dublin. So they're like, uh, let's call the zoo. And the zoo says, sorry, fresh out. And the guy's probably, they think he's like going to lose at least his leg or something like that. Um, but then Liverpool you, in, in the UK says, you know what? We've got some. And they send it over to him and they save this guy, just like the Beatles from Liverpool came and saved the world with their music. So no fatalities. One dangerous snake bite, 2020 snake history, St. Patrick's Day. There you go. Who, who, who keeps this snake as a pet? There's a bunch of weirdos out there that have snakes and lizards. and. Uh, actually, I was in, uh, you know, it was UPS or FedEx. I was in FedEx a couple days ago here in, in Ralston, the area of Omaha that I live in. And um, we were... I was waiting in line for a package. It was, it happened to be my wife's medicine that she has to take now. And, uh, there was a guy in front of me. Um, but in a different line, there was two lines. He was in front of me in that line. He gets to the counter and he's like, Hey, I, I I'm here to pick up my package. It contains live animals. Uh, and so the lady at the counter was like, okay, can I get your ID? I just need to make sure, you know, so I can clear them to you. Well, by the time he gets his package, I'm at the counter asking for, for mine. Mine comes in a cooler and whatnot. 
and he uh, gets very angry when he sees his package. And his package wasn't damaged in my mind. Like, there was one little, like, it wasn't even a dent. It was like a, you, a crease that you could see from it being, like, folded, maybe. And he flipped out. Like, he was yelling. Everybody was staring at him. I'm just there to try to get my wife's medicine. <laughs> and he's like, I had three geckos and two very, very expensive snakes in here, one of which could have killed anybody that damaged the package and gave whatever, um, like an maybe open. Don't, maybe don't ship those. And so I was like sitting there like, wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know, three geckos and two snakes, he said. Three lizards and two snakes or something like that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. He must have had them overnighted. I don't know. There was no, like, holes punched in the box. So, yeah. Interesting, though. Here's People are shipping snakes? Yeah, I, I assume. And I assume, like I said, it must be overnighted because there's no way they could have survived in that box. For Yeah, regular. especially in a plane. It'd be cold, I would think. Weird. Yeah, I don't know. I remember a couple years ago in down in Papillion on 84th Street, so it's where it turns into Washington Street. Yeah. There was an apartment complex there, and the guy died because his boa constrictor got out and choked him in the middle of the night. <laughs> that, was a, that was about four or five years ago. When I was a kid, my dad had a friend who kept snakes, and I got to hold a boa constrictor at his house. Um, and neither my dad or myself knew that those snakes were illegally owned. Oh. Uh, so the police found out and they confiscated him. Uh, he and by the time that they confiscated, I think he had two boas, a python, and something else. But there was four Dang. snakes confiscated. That was Columbus, Nebraska. So <laughs> snakes, man. There you go. Who's got this kind of time on their hands? Like we got three dogs and that's enough. Like regular old stinky dogs. And that's, that is plenty. People are snakes and lizards and come on. My eighth grade class in science, the teacher had like a boa or something in the classroom. Had a, he built a case for it, had a big long stick and the snake would just kind of do his thing. And there I had a heat lamp and stuff. And yeah, that was an, ooh. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Sophomore year, high school, my biology teacher had a, the I don't know what they're called uh bearded dragons that's what they were they had two of them in there so those were cool well I looked these up on untapped and untapped does not have listings for black and tan or snake bite now yeah. there are yingling for example makes a black and tan yep they do I I'm interested in that like how do you maintain the uh how do you maintain that in the bottle? I guess. Gotta be, I got to think it's more of a flavor profile than a delineation of liquids. That, that would seem hard to me in a can. It is fun though that I, like I've got the Murphy's that's left is just like, a, it's just like a little scoop of ice cream there on the bottom after all that's over, which is odd. So let's do this. Let's rate out of five each drink. Okay. Uh, Black and tan, I'll start. I'll, I'd say three. That was that was fun to try. Yeah. I don't need to do it again. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you there. But if we're going out of five, I'm going to go right down the middle. I'm going to go 2.5. Ooh. Um, yeah, I go 2.75, right in, the, right, right in between you two there. It just, just a, yeah, it, 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 it's a gimmick. It's something I'd probably, I'll give it a shot again at some point, maybe. Mm -hmm. eh. I'd I'd make it again, just you know, maybe next time I'm at Brazen Head, I'll order one just to see. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Brazen Head is just an Irish restaurant here in Omaha. Mm -hmm. So now snake bite on the other hand. This this sounds like you're going high. I feel like you're preparing to say four. I'm going like four and four point two five. Whoa. Because yeah, I would order a second one of these and maybe a third. Mm -hmm. that's exactly where i was gonna go four two five what yeah i really liked it, it was I, really I good. Too. yeah well luckily i have enough to make another one 
Now, if I have we, enough to make it two more, actually, I think. If we could get like a tradition, like a traditional cider locally, mm-hmm. and we could try this with a local stout, that would be a lot. I think that would be a blast. That would be a lot of fun. Glo- glacial till in cross train maybe I don't yeah know. or like uh saro cider down in lincoln area they yeah. have some stuff like that um yeah i'm sure we could do it a craft beer version yeah yeah i i would do that again there's sweetness with the stout it's just it's just a nice combination that i didn't know if i would like and i liked it a lot i definitely don't have the delineation anymore but you do still have the nitro foam that <sighs> Does not mix at all. Just sits on the top. Yeah, well, that's that mine is mine is giant at this point. Yeah, so it's almost like ice cream. I could eat it like ice cream. Where's my spoon? Let's see. Could I eat it? Yeah, look, it's almost like you'd eat it like ice cream. Yep, like a root beer float. <laughs> Actually, it kind of tastes good. <laughs> kind of weird. All right. Well, happy St. Patrick's Day to you wherever you are. Hopefully, you're safe. Not going to some big tent party or or yeah. whatever clearly that's we're in the same boat as we were last year with our you know with 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 this holiday but maybe next year i don't know maybe next year we go on we go to an irish bar somewhere and maybe talk to somebody irish who knows i i, I just hope i want to go out so bad and just do something that i'm, I'm just fishing here yeah Makes just sense. throw some corn beef and cabbage in your crock pot and <coughs> oh, that was my turn <laughs> good job and have a great green beer, St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, I uh, I have a fun. Don't I'll send it to you. Maybe we could. Uh, I have a fun uh, smoked corned beef recipe that I have tried. And if you smoke it long enough and at a low enough temperature, it is so tender and delicious. It's oh, it's fantastic. And at the end, you quarter the corn. You quarter the uh, cabbage. Put some. Uh, uh, butter and salt and pepper and you wrap it all in foil and you stick it in a smoker along with it and it's woo, is great that sounds great mm, yeah it's amazing oh all right well brian luck of the irish to you we're not going anywhere for a while let's have another beer Thank you for listening to A Beer with Atlas. Special thanks to our brand team for producing the show. Each episode of A Beer with Atlas is powered by Atlas Medstaff, an industry leader in travel healthcare staffing.